What's going on, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to five recently released albums that you should check out. Only it's not five recently released albums that you should check out, it's seven, because we have two more than we usually do. So we're going to just shut up and get right into it. These are albums that came out this past weekend that you need in your life. So our first one is Thy Cat the Falk with their brand new album, Meta. This is a one-man show uh, by and large, that does have some female vocals along for the ride to help him out. And this is a nine track avant garde affair, and it is massive. It is 66 minutes in length and has a lot to offer. So, while you do hear some of the remnants of you know extreme metal that are really particled throughout this disc, throughout these nine tracks, it's one that is offset a little bit by the weirdness of the avant garde genre. So, you get a little bit of space metal, you get a little bit of just keyboard centered exploration, and Really, the biggest and most uh, real commonplace thing that you're going to hear is a little bit of folk sort of thrown in there, or pagan metal, in order to really give it that full effect and, and really grant it a lot of charm and grace. Man, this is a really hard album to stop listening to, especially whenever you get into track number six, which is a 21-minute long epic. You might wonder why I'm not saying song titles, they're in a different language, I don't want to destroy it. I may have destroyed the title of this band, so I'm going to let you discover this one on your own. But 21 minutes seems like a really harrowing procedure, but this is the highlight, the center point, and the true, real love of this album. So excellently paced, so very well written, and just a song that stays with you long after its completion duration has concluded. Damn, this is definitely a potential late game contender. You don't want to miss it, so check it out. Up next, we have Monsteriophonic by Lordy. It's just as fun to say as it looks whenever you type it out. That's actually the harder part. So this is a 64-minute, 14-track affair from the only heavy metal slash hard rock band to win Eurovision. Yes, they still have that distinction, and it still is surprising to those who... Uh, who are finding out for the first time that such a thing has happened, because it would never happen in America. That's why Europe is kind of a cooler place in some formats. But this is a band that is able to sort of change their style up a little bit. They're able to embrace a little heavier style of metal, whether it be a direct approach or one that's supposed to be a little bit more of paying an homage to whether it be thrash or a little bit of metalcore. Hug You Hardcore off of this disc does not have that sort of hard, uh, hardcore beatdown deathcore format to it, but it's definitely one where they raise up uh, the heaviness volume a little bit to kind of simulate that idea a little bit. And I love the fact that this band still is tongue-in-cheek to the core, considering this, uh, the very second track that you get off of this disc is entitled Let's Go Slaughter He-Man, I Wanna Be the Beast Man in the Masters of the Universe. It's almost like poetry. It's almost like Steel Panther decided to get an action figure collection that wasn't just a Pamela Anderson, you know, from Baywatch. It's crazy how talented these guys are, considering their ships that they give uh, in their sound. With Mary is Dead going into Sick Flick and then going into None for One, all three of those tracks feel like, even though they sort of come back to that same core hard rock heavy metal philosophy, that they have an identity all of their own. And the second half of this disc is where it really begins to open up. That's where we start to see tracks that are six minutes, five and a half minutes. And then, of course, The Night the Monsters Died concludes this disc at seven minutes and 13 seconds, starting to tell, uh, take and draw a little bit more of that horror theme, of that horror background, you know, that really goes so deeply into their live shows in order to create a full and enriching atmosphere. These are guys that are going deep whenever it comes to their craft, and it's something that has certainly paid off. They've gotten the accolades of the past. This is an accolade uh, real warranting album. It's got a lot of positive factors that you definitely need to scope out. If you like Rob Zombie and you're not listening to Lordy or you think that Lordy is just wannabes, you're the wannabe because, man, these guys take it to a level that Zombie probably wishes that he had the imagination to take it to. And that's no knock to Zombie, considering Zombie's taken things some, you know, definite places. These two are very complimentary. You should check this album out. Ruheria with Poncho Aslan is our third observation for today. These guys are an extreme metal band that is not from Guadalajara, Mexico, as reported by some. Uh, they are actually based around uh, the southwest United States. However, this has been their first album in uh, roughly about 15 years. This is a lineup that's a super group that at some point in time throughout its... Legacy has boasted Dino from Fear Factory, Shane Embry, Nicholas Baker, uh, to name just a few. 
Uh, now, with this return album, it's a 13-track affair, and if there's one thing that Eugerio has been known for in the past was controversy uh, with some of their album covers, as well as their blatant references uh, to Satanism, to drugs, to this and that, a lot of violence. Uh, it's all sung in the Spanish tongue, and this is one that certainly follows within that, uh, those footsteps. It's not always the cleanest that you might imagine, but this is extreme metal through and through. Extreme metal is not always meant to have a little bit of a tidiness to it. It's either that or a production value that truly makes it sound a little bit more, you know, polished whenever the roughness of the lyricism and the roughness of the music is sort of meant to be its own atmosphere. It sort of takes that old school philosophy a little bit to heart, and it's definitely one thing that helps. Uh, overall, this is a smooth disc whenever it comes to the overall songwriting. It feels like this was a good set of songs for them to go with for this album. Uh, the vocals can at times uh, really take some adjustment uh, if you are unfamiliar with this band. It may take some adjustment at first, but once you get used to it, it becomes a very smooth listen, an apt comeback album. Uh, one that, honestly, uh, there was some hype that was built around it. I don't think it quite measured up to that, but still has a nice extreme... Uh, exterior to it and what you gain from it is really a little bit of a spyglass into uh, extreme metal history as well so definitely a lot of value here uh, that you should certainly examine for yourself so definitely do that. Not too much needs said about our fourth album of this week which is Breaking Out of Hell by Airborne. Basically if you're kind of upset that ACDC has gotten older that they are probably going to be retiring from the touring and the album creation market in the coming year or so. Airborne's a band that's got a little bit more of a, uh, of a snarl to them because of their youth. They're a lot younger than ACDC, obviously, but they are very complimentary in format because this band, whenever you listen to them, they just glisten with ACDC you know, reference with ACDC influence. It's almost as though the band somehow is the twisted offspring of ACDC making love to some female band that was like, you know, a covers band or a tribute band. And they were all chicks. And ACDC stormed into town one night and said, well, um, we have a good idea on how to keep this uh, style of music going long into the new millennium. And here you go, Airborne was born. Uh, this is a disc that is really accented by some of its key standout tracks. Breaking Out of Hell, the title track, is the first one that you gain, and you immediately get that sense of, you know, ACDC thump, that fantastic guitar work that has that hard rock uh, real center point to it. And then you get into songs such as I'm Going to Hell for This or It's Never Too Late for Me. Uh, Any time where it seems like this album may opt to slow down for just a moment, it immediately thrusts itself right back into that mid-tempo, right back into that real comfortable position, making this one a really enjoyable traveling album. Uh, but whenever it comes to, you know, knocking the world on fire and knocking socks off, Back in Black, this certainly is not. And in 2016, I don't think an album like Back in Black changes the world like it did back in the early 1980s. But either way, Airborne's a fun band, definitely a release to examine. We do tend to talk a lot on the Five Reasons series about post-metal, about post-black metal, uh, black gaze, as well as space metal, mainly because they are some genres of uh, heavy metal that tend to collide a good bit, and with Lotus Thieves' brand new album, Grammarie, this is certainly true once again. This is a five-track affair that really takes a lot of inspiration, draws a lot of it uh, from the occult, and especially those that throughout world history were seen as very extreme, either that or... Uh, were seen as big movements, such as the Book of the Dead is one of the track cuts on here, which is based around, of course, the Egyptian philosophy. Uh, the Book of Lies was in Crowley, and, and there's a track here called Salem, which I think we're getting the point here. Uh, but really, what is to be marveled at on this album is the way in which it's able to seamlessly go back and forth from sort of the more black gaze or post-black metal uh, influences and sort of going into a couple of other notches, especially that space metal philosophy, which we have seen a couple of times on uh, this week's episode, which is kind of neat considering it does open up a lot of chance and opportunity for atmosphere. Whenever things get pretty harsh on this album, it's not something that is uh, both collectively, lyrically, as well as musically. It's more so just the musical aggression that you hear. Uh, the lyricism and the voices are something that it sort of floats over, I guess. Uh, it sort of floats over the music. It has a sort of ethereal element to it, which grants it a little bit of charm by comparison to some of the others that you hear within these departments. Uh, a lot of those will focus on trying to present a dual attack. This one focuses more 
up its uh, percentage on the clean vocal and trying to represent things in a way that feels very sincere, uh, almost as though you are going through history itself, uh, both musically as well as uh, through uh, the lyrics that you are hearing. And they are definitely a strength of this album. The music itself also is very nice considering its transitions are not jagged. We spoke a couple of uh, days ago in the In the Woods album about how sometimes a very jagged sudden stop or sudden changeover was able to really be, uh, really present some shock factor and really present some uh, really unique opportunities for the avant garde department. But here, everything feels very, very smooth and it really does create some beautiful atmosphere to kind of go with this very sort of non-beautiful themology, you know, at least non-beautiful in the eyes of many. It's a really solid album, definitely a surprise of the week! So definitely scope this one out. Breakdown of Sanity with Coexistence. Six albums in now, so we're past the typical five. Now, Breakdown of Sanity is a melodic metalcore band, at least in my designation. Uh, this is an 11-track affair that's around 42 minutes in length, and I really like the energy that is presented on this disc. It's not necessarily 100% totally uh, my thing. I think that there are uh, there's definitely a market out there for this, considering of some of the people that this uh, band really reminds me of. They remind me a lot of the Gothenburg movement a little bit, with In Flames and Soil Work definitely coming to mind. But also some of the more moderate metal that you hear here uh, in America, uh, Slipknot, with their intensity and with their energy, certainly comes to mind whenever I listen to some of these cuts, as well as other uh, bands like them, such as A Fool For My Valentine or A Trivium. Uh, the rapid-fire lyrical delivery is something that does make this band's uh, energy really showcase itself all the damn time. This is not something that feels like it ever takes a vacation, with the lone, lone, ex uh, the real exception of that being the title track, Coexistence, which is more of an ambient setup for the final cut, New World. Uh, but the Grand Illusion is the song that really, uh, really spoke to me uh, on this, this, considering it has that same delivery process, that rapid-fire sort of machine-gun delivery, but then has a fantastic solo that just feels absolutely laced in, in bands such as Soil Work and that variety, and it's just very well executed. It's something that whenever they do employ it, it, it does impress you. It does give you uh, that real feel of variety, and these are, uh, these are guys that certainly are going to make an impact on the market in some way. I, I think that Breakdown of Sanity is going to find a lot of ears, and those ears are going to be pleased with what they are uh, consuming. But uh, I want to know what you guys think about this, so especially uh, let me know in the comments below about that one, and let's move on to our final observation. The last album we're going to look at today is Narnia's self-titled album. Now, this is a band that is of the progressive metal distinction that has more power metal or neoclassical metal infused in, so really those two adjectives feel a little bit more apt, but there is some prog influence also. Uh, they're a Christian band as well, which kind of presents... Uh, its own set of, I guess, rules or at least topic uh, of pot uh, potential. You know, this is a band uh, that has been going at it for a while since the latter portions of the 90s. They did take a break for a while, but did recently reform. Uh, now, I like this band uh, and this album for a couple of different reasons. I do like the ease of listen to this, and it's uh, really based off of some of those influences that feel as distant as some of the 1970s with that hard rock influence, which is something that you hear uh, on a track such as On the Highest Mountain. Uh, however, this is an album that also sometimes gets a little bit cluttered by, I guess, age, uh, in a way. At, at some points, these feel a little bit uh, very uh, simple, I suppose. Whenever you listen to the lyrics of Reaching for the Top, the very first song on this, it feels extremely simple, something that you've heard a thousand times before, perhaps boasted by the likes of Ronnie James Dio's and people of that variety uh, for throughout the 1980s even, and still uh, we do hear that a good bit whenever people are sort of pledging their love for heavy metal, and uh, you hear this sort of uh, representation of going out and performing the show, bringing the fire, etc. Uh, a track such as Thank You is a little bit more of a ballad style, and this feels a little bit more geared toward the faith that they do have within the Christian uh, following, uh, and you do get that a little bit more with some of the other cuts that end this disc. It can at times be a bit of a trial of a listen. It's at times one that feels uh, a little bit hampered by its own deriv uh, derivative nature. It's not something that you felt like is brand new. It feels like you have heard this before, uh, but they do have a little bit of charm. I do like some of their songwriting prowess. It's just something that 
I, I think the age is starting to uh, factor in a little bit, but overall still kind of a smooth listen. One that if you are uh, really beckoning toward this side of music, uh, you're going to find a lot of neat little tropes. It's almost like that perfect balance between faith and rocking hard. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Seven recently released albums that you should check out. Uh, this has been a lot of fun, but of course this has meant that many of the things I've wanted to assault with full reviews have not gotten those. And I think that my problem has been I have completely and totally oversold my own capabilities and, you know, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's a lot of stuff to take in. Um, if you have any comments about the seven bands that we talked about today, do leave them in the comments below if you're excited about the like 10 million albums that are coming out this weekend. Seriously, it's a, another huge weekend. Uh, let me know in the comments below. I can't get to everything, so if you suggest something and I don't talk about it, I apologize, but that's just the name of the game. I'm one guy. That's how it is. Um, if you want to pop a uh, donation over to the Patreon or to the one-time donation, check out the uh, links in the description box below. Anything that you do give, I'm exceptionally thankful for. My name is Cover Killer Nation, and I'll talk to you guys next time. Take care.